This episode of TOEFOP is brought to you by Movement Watches. Get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to movement.com forward slash TOEFOP. Oh my God, we've got a sponsor for this podcast? Can you believe it? They just don't learn, do they? I mean, this is, I mean, this is pretty historic. I mean, we've been doing this for eight years and finally, yeah. Movement Watches, they've got excited about the TOEFOP brand expanding, Charlie. This is very exciting. Well, I think it's all the talk of time travel. It makes sense that a watch company would sponsor us. I mean, that's a very good point. This is the number one time travel podcast, I'm going to say, in the entire world. And so here's the thing you need if you're a time traveler, an affordable and stylish watch. That's right. And movement watches start, Will, at just $95 with Shut over up. a million watches sold in over 160 countries. No way. Go to movement.com forward slash TOEFOP and join the movement. I'm joining it. The following episode of TOEFOP is rated M.A. It may contain Batman references, time travel references, sexual references, lost trains of thought, and mild coarse language. TOEFOP advises that the program is not suitable for anyone under the age of 15 or anyone who enjoys succinct, coherent conversation that might actually have a point. Minors must be accompanied by a parent, guardian, or priest. This is John Deke speaking. This is Tofop. I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson. Hello, Charlie. How are you? Well, no, the question is, Will, how are you? I mean, you are still embedded in the US of A and uh, wow, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Well, here's the good news, Charlie. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it. I don't know if it made worldwide news, but uh, uh, this country, there's been, a, there's been a little trouble. There's been some trouble going on and mostly it's had to do with uh, white men going on marches and starting shit, right? Well, here's the good mm. news, Charlie. I am in no position to go on a march. The good news <laughs> is <laughs> there is no way I'm going to get caught up in any of this white nationalism and any of these Nazi salutes. I can't raise my hand high enough to do a Nazi salute without hurting my back. So in some ways, it's been a very good time to have a terrible back. But no, I'm, um, I'm still pretty terrible, to be honest. I still am not sitting down i uh had quite a i had to go to vermont burlington vermont which was a really beautiful part of america and had some great shows there um had to fly there i had actually paid for my flight to get upgraded so i had a bit of extra extra leg room and stuff for the for the flight it wasn't too bad and then burlington's a really beautiful little town so i spent most of the weekend just like casually walking around my back was feeling okay and then i had to fly out of burlington on sunday and our plane got delayed out of Burlington. I was flying Burlington to Newark, which is like a New York airport. And then I was going to fly Newark to Los Angeles, right? So the first mm. bit of the plane got delayed, which meant I missed my connection uh, out of Newark, right? So United, mm. they're the airline that drags people off. United yeah. decided that despite the fact that I'd paid for an aisle and some extra leg room, that they would just put me on the next flight to LA, which is like a seven, six, seven hour flight in a middle seat with no extra leg room. And I was mm. like, oh no, I've already been inv involved in one airline incident this year. I'm not getting arrested <laughs> yeah. a second time. I know how this shit goes down. <laughs> and I'm like, so I ended up having to skip that flight entirely. I spent six hours at Newark airport, just like walking around the airport, like waiting so they could eventually get on a flight. They got me on a window seat with some extra leg room. But then the two people next to me both went to sleep because it was like nighttime at this stage. They've mm. both gone to sleep with their tray tables down with stuff on them. So then I was just uh. jammed in this seat that I could not get out of for six hours flying back from New York. So it's fair to say the next day was mm. not at my best. So, because people might not know, but the best thing for your back ride is to be up and moving around. So... If you stay sitting for too long, that's like agony for you, right? Absolute agony. The worst is actually cabs and, are you, and cars. And, and, and are you too polite to have just woken those people up? Like, it wasn't one of those things where it's like, look, this takes precedence because I've been kicked off a plane once. I'll do it again unless you guys move <laughs> this fucking tray. Um, there was a point, Charlie, 
where I thought that I was going to just have to wet my pants. There was literally a point where my bladder felt like it was about to explode and I was so reticent to cause a fuss because I knew, A, I'm going to have to wake both of them up, B, we're going to have to get the stuff out of the way, C, I know how long it takes me to sort of unwind from being jammed in that, so it's not going to be some quick, easy process where I can just jump over the top of them. They're both going to have to get up, it's going to take me ages to get out, then it's going to take me ages to go to the bathroom, then they will have sat back down, so when I come back, they're going to have to stand up again, and I just, in my head, was like, it will be just better to wet myself and sit here in my own wetness than disturb them. You should be, of all people, you should be welcoming the uh, uh, oncoming apocalypse because in this sort of new world order, there is a chance that you could elevate yourself to some kind of like, I don't know, um, warlord or leader where you could just be carried around. Like you won't have to sit down anymore and take conventional transport. Like if you become the new Immortan Joe of the wasteland, then, you know, you could maybe just have like a group of people just carrying you around. You can be prone at all times so you don't actually have to bend your body into a sitting position. Well, firstly, uh, there has been times in the last two months where I've been in so much pain that you're absolutely right. I have been number one welcoming the oncoming apocalypse. Mm. I was the only guy who the other day when saw that Donald Trump was trying to start a nuclear war on Twitter who was wrapped. I was like, this is brilliant. If you could do it before I need to catch my next flight, that'd be really handy. Thanks, Donnie. So firstly, you're absolutely correct. (laughs) Secondly, I have been thinking of late because my lifestyle, the job that I have has been adding to the fact that my back isn't recovering because I've had to go to these pitch meetings. I've had to go to these shows and whatever. And it's involved, you know, getting on planes, getting on cars, that sort of thing. And Mm. so in some ways I have been hampering my own recovery by still trying to go about my work. Right. Um, Yeah. I am thinking about maybe I need a career change. Maybe I need something where I can use the skills that I have, but I don't have to have the same lifestyle that's clearly destroying my body. And you have suggested something that I hadn't really thought about on that list, but I was thinking, you know what? Because in my head, I'm like, uh, maybe I need to get some job where I'm in the same place, you know, a long time in a row rather than having to travel around all the time. I'm in the life of a touring stand-up comedian, particularly here in America where I'm on, you know, economy, you know, seats on long flights in between shows and stuff like that is probably not necessarily the right lifestyle for me to fix myself. So in my head, I've been like, oh, well, I probably need to get like a, a solid, you know, job somewhere where I can just stay in the same place. But You've, you've come Despot. up with a much better idea, which is yeah. I can become Despot. some, I can use my powers of being able to unite a group of disparate yeah. people behind my philosophy and my charismatic public speaking into some yeah. sort of movement where I also ask them to carry me around. That's a much better well, solution. What are, you need to find, Will, is a citadel in the middle of the desert that has the only like water source of anywhere around. Like, let's get ahead of the game. Like, we know what's coming. You've just got to find a protected fortress in Citadel. You get some milk mothers in there, like getting some milk out there. Find yourself like seven brides, lock them in a room as breeders, and then you're halfway, uh, halfway there. You just need to find like a, a horse skull that you can turn into an oxygen mask. Okay, Charlie, firstly, I'm taking you on board as an advisor when this happens. You, yeah, can, be my, you can be my little finger. You can be my... Yeah. Con- <laughs> My consigliere. <laughs> so, because <laughs> he's, oh, I have somewhere that I could do this, Charlie. We're not, we're not yeah. even, like, because the thing is, my parents, you know, when they eventually, you know, don't, don't uh, own the farm anymore, then a third of that farm will essentially be distributed between my brother who runs the farm, my sister and myself, mm. right? So I actually mm. have, a third of some land in a very, oh very, like, I mean, there's only 250 people there, right? This is a like, yeah. regional area. It's away from sort of all authorities and people who might be snooping on our stuff. And it's already pre-existing. I already know the area. That would be, yeah. how do you think my brother would feel if I said, hey, hey, bro, I know you've been running the farm and doing a really good job, but I'm going to need a third of the land to start my cult. Yeah, I think that's all right. I mean, if he gets to still do what he's doing, and you would obviously... That you, you, we could pay rent, like on where we decide to start this cult. Yeah. We could pay your, your brother a bit of land tax. And the great thing about Hayfield is we've got a troubadour there to write songs of inspiration about like this cult of Will Anderson. What's his name? You know, Hayfield Girls guy. What was his name? Yeah, it Hayfield War? Girls. 
Yeah, that guy. Hey, Phil Girls guy. That guy. Yeah. Well, the guy well, who we gave him more hits than he's ever had on YouTube. And the way he repaid us was to say, oh, I wish these guys hadn't made fun so much of the people. Of It's like, mate. We celebrated your song. We got you more listeners than ever before. So we go back to him and we say, listen, we got you 5,000 hits on YouTube. Michael War, that's it. Thank you, Mike Al. We'll, you become our troubadour. You just write sort of political songs that sort of like uh, 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 celebrate uh, this cult and, and Will's vision for the future. But what platform are you... Like what, if, if this is some kind of like uh, 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 apocalyptic cult, what, what is your platform to get people on board? Well, basically, firstly, you kind of set up the community, I think. And that's going to be pretty easy because you've just got to appeal to things. I think mostly for people who want to join cults. Yeah, there's going to be some belief in the you know, bigger ideals. But mostly, I reckon it's a lifestyle thing. I think for a lot of people, like if you can just set up the cult in a way that it feels fun to be part of the cult. So obviously for me, yeah, we've got the farming community. So I think, you know, mm. we're, we're making our own food and that sort of stuff. I think it's kind of like a self-sufficient. We use the land yeah. to start growing our own <laughs> crops. And I love how you say like we and our as if we would be doing any of this shit. Like let's first things first, we need to get into internet connection there. So you and I can like go online and watch YouTube and stuff. So we get people work in the fields, you know, so we can just continue to watch YouTube. I mean, what's the, do you know what the broadband coverage is like in Hayfield? Charlie. <laughs> like, is that the first? No, well, I, the, the way I'm seeing it is that like our podcasts are like, you know, a testament or like a, a book of the Bible mm. or like, you know, a, a commandments. So basically we mm. get in on a Monday morning or whatever and we mm. do the podcast and it's all about, you know, what we want to achieve that week, you know, like what we want to plant, so, sort of the general philosophies of yeah. the cult and whatever. And then they yeah. listen to it over and over during their days there's uh, a bit of like a guiding yes. sort of spirit of what they should be doing and what the cult is but yeah. it also has a kind of brainwashing effect as well it's like the space monkeys in fight club you know when they all start coming to the house so when people come to the farm we have to test their loyalty first of all like we tell them to piss off we don't want you in our cult get out of here we don't want you and if they stick around after a number of days they're in they've passed the first test yeah, and I, you have to do that. That's what I like. Okay. That you, that's, yeah. that's one of your roles, is that when a newbie yeah. comes along, because you're so nice, but you use your powers of acting to assume My powers of acting. the role where you, <laughs> like, you go out. That's your role. And it amuses yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think like, I'll just, the first thing I'll do is I'll go with a cup of coffee and I'll just throw it in their face. Right. <laughs> just like, get out of here. <laughs> we don't want you. I mean, but the thing is, I'm imagining we're starting from like the bare bones. So... You, it's, I imagine it's just you and I just like, well, you're not sitting. I'm sitting on a log. You're standing next to the log in the middle of this field. <laughs> so we don't really have anything for people to come and assemble at. But still, you know, we'll get a few curious onlookers coming by. The first person that comes past, I'll just storm up to them and throw a coffee in their face. A coffee that I've been nursing the whole time waiting for the first person to arrive. <laughs> yeah, it's actually cold. It's not hot. It's, it's cold. like a cold yeah. coffee. <laughs> It actually gets cold in Hayfield, doesn't it? So it's probably just like a just a, a block of ice that I throw out of the cup into their face. All right, that's look, great. So let's say to, hypothetically... To, to be honest, look, we don't actually have to do any of those things because the bare fact that our cult is based just outside Hayfield will be enough of a deterrent to most of the population. <laughs> we will know <laughs> that if we're willing to go and live in a field just outside Hayfield, that they've already pretty much passed a Fight Club-esque... Well, okay, so are we saying that... Is this something that we are going to... We're just going to land in Hayfield and start it? Or do we want to start seeding now the idea? Like kind of like, um, um, uh, uh, what was that, uh, the cult who, who they all committed suicide to get on the comet? What those guys called? The the Hale, Children of God was that the Hale-Bock comet ones? Whatever they yeah, were? And that, they all Michael, wore Nikes? Up? Are they the ones who yeah, cut off their guys. testicles? Yeah, they cut what? I didn't know they cut off their balls. I believe that, that they also cut off their balls. Yeah, okay, right. Well, let's say we start seeding now some myths and some legends to get people to meet us in Hayfield. Let's, 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 let's like plan long term. So let's say we're going to start this in six months, right? right. So we need, we need to start sort of seeding the idea that Hayfield is some kind of sacred land for us, the Heaven's Gate cult. Thank you, Michael. Um, that, there, that That's our sacred meeting spot. So I think we can start sort of, if we create you as the Messiah figure, you're connected to the land because this is the birthplace of Will Anderson. And Will Anderson is coming home to reclaim, you know, the, not only the land his parents own, but the land, the land where he was born. We need the government to do some sort of 
nationwide you know they're doing this postal vote about marriage equality we need them to do yeah. some nationwide version of the census where they require everyone to go back to their place of origin that's where yes. that's where it'd be really great if we had to go back to hayfield for some reason but yeah no so it's a spiritual thing and mostly yeah. it's just about at the start it's just about smoking pot because we're going to grow some pot mm -hmm. down there we're going to smoke some pot we're going to make some organic food we'll brew our own beer it'll just be a really cool chill Free love again, when, when we say we, we mean you guys. I mean, <laughs> again, I couldn't. <laughs> we will talk about this on the podcast and then yeah. the rest of our followers will listen to the podcast and they will do our wishes. They will know yeah. it is good and they'll present us with some beer. Yeah. Some, <laughs> some kombucha in the morning and some <laughs> beer, beer after midday. Okay, fantastic. I love this. I love this. Do we, okay, is there a uniform? Yes. Okay. And what I like about it is that the men dress like me and the women dress like you. That's the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got facial hair. I have no, a beard. I mean, they don't have to Charlie up. That's offensive. Oh, right. They're right. not going to like... They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not fancy face. dressing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, but how would you epitomize the difference in our attire? Like, you're all black. I guess that's kind of easy. Yeah. But what's my attire? I don't really know that I have a distinctive look. Now, I know that you say that, but I am not the only person who has noticed that there is this major Latino pop star or something who is top <laughs> yeah. of the charts, who literally seems like he's stolen like eight of your looks. Every time I see one of his film clips, I can't remember <laughs> what he's called, but he's like the biggest star in the world. He's like the Latino pit bull or whatever. And he has, yeah, yeah. it's like he's gone through, it's like Gemma shot the film clip and he didn't bring any of his own clothes to the set. And so yeah. he just went through your wardrobe <laughs> and wore it. I mean, the funny thing is, like, whenever people talk about, oh, this person looks just like you or whatever, you're always like, nah, nah, nah. And the amount of people have sent me that, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> okay, he kind of <laughs> looks like it. Because he's got the shoulder tattoo. He's got the, he's got the, he's got the three-day growth. And you're right. Like, his choice of clothes is very similar to mine. He likes a flannel shirt. He likes a black sleeveless tee. <laughs> yes! Like, seriously, he's got two distinct looks that I bet I could find photos of you dressed the exact same way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's make it simple for the female members of our cult. Yep. They just have to wear a red flannel shirt and black jeans, or like black jeans and a black sleeveless tee. That that that's the two looks. One can be winter and one can be summer. Yeah, that's good. I like that. That's practical also for the farm environment. You don't want to be wearing white down on a dairy farm. You know what I mean? Like a lot of time spent washing. I think black is practical. It's nice. So yeah. Although does black suggest, I mean, we want this to be a hope, hope oh, well, we haven't even discussed it. Is this a hopeful cult or is this a, like a death cult? Oh, it'll start as the first, then it'll end as the latter, like all of them. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done. I feel like we've done an episode about our, our cult before, but maybe this is, we'll, we'll treat this like chapter two. This is well, us. I mean, we've talked about the idea of starting a cult out of the podcast, but I think we've, this is the other way around. We've thought about starting the cult. And now we're just leveraging the podcast for cult reasons. <laughs> Two really distinct well, conversations, Charlie. Well, that's what you need, right? Like you need state media if you're going to start. Like yeah. if you're going to, we need a propaganda, propaganda wing. And I think that that's what this could be. What we need to get, oh, we're missing a huge opportunity here. Because it's all well and good for us to be up on the pulpit spreading the word of TOFOP. Yeah. But with FOFOP, you get guests coming in all the time. We somehow need to get those people to just be endorsing us the entire yeah. time. Like every person you get on needs to endorse us. Fearless yes. leaders. No, that's the good point. That's how we get out to the community. Like Justin Bieber just came to Australia to do this big thing for Hillsong. We need to yep. use the Hillsong model, right? That's yes. really what we need to do. We need to bring a bit of Hillsong. We want to be the Hillsong of cults. That's, you know, in the same way as Hillsong has revolutionized going to church and made it kind of cool yeah. and groovy and young, but it's still church and they're still taking a big percentage of your money and all those sort of things. But they've kind of taken an uber, modern, hip Google approach to church. We need to take that mm. same model. We need to disrupt cults. That's what we're talking about. We're talking yeah. about a cult startup. We're talking about bringing a new professional attitude to cults that just cults haven't had before. Okay, how about this for a radical idea? When we first discussed the cult of TOEFOP, we said, look, we're just going to have to sleep with everyone's wives. Yeah. But how about we become the first monogamous cult? 
where it's like, let's flip it on its head. We all like have partners that we're committed to. And it's like, there's no sleeping around. There's no kind of like, we're going to bring your wives and let us have sex with them. It's the only way we're going to do it. I like it. I like it. It's, you know what I like about that is? It's a market that just has not been catered for before in cults. Because cults exactly. are traditionally, like I bet there's heaps of people who've wanted to join a cult, but they're like, you know what? I'd love to join the cult, but I, I love my wife. And I don't want to yeah. fuck somebody else's wife. I love cults. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. My wife and I both love cults. We'd love to be involved in a cult, but can't we just have a cult where we cult during the day and then we go home together and watch MasterChef? Yeah, I guess that's, well, and, and I kind of figure that we're not the kind of cult where, like we're not, there's no God complex with what, I mean, neither of us believe in God. So no. it would be ridiculous for us to sort of like be putting us, uh, ourselves forward as some kind of like God figure. Where do, we are saying we're better than all of you. We're not disputing that. We are, you know, we are the leaders of this cult. No, but I don't think that's what figures. we're saying. I don't think we we're saying? saying that we're better than them because I don't think either of us truly believe that. But here's what I'm saying we need from our cult members. We need them to believe that we are better than them. That's one of the requirements of being in the cult. Like, right. the point is, we want people who are better than us in this cult, people who can build things yeah. and arrange things and grow things. But we want them to be under the mistaken belief that we are superior to them. That's what we're looking for, really. That's our key demo for a cult. So how do we... So uh, we're just, we're just going to neg a bunch of kind of like very capable, smart followers? We just neg them the whole time? It's like, yeah, it's a pretty, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good hut, but I uh, heard there's a cult across the road that do even bigger huts. It wasn't the way I was going to go, but now I hear the words coming out of your mouth. It feels right. It feels yeah. like, again, because I feel like you're my real, because you've got many more plans for the cult. I feel like I'm more, you sort of just like, you know, say hey something man, spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Here are some you're like the, you're, like the, you're like the Steve Jobs. I'm just going to take some acid and have a fucking vision. But I'm the, like the Wozniak. I'm the guy's like, well, how do we implement this? Like, how do we actually make this happen, Will? It's all well and good that you just want to fucking live off, you know, live off grid and have this fucking like, lifestyle. But how do we make this work? How do we control these people? I'm your St Steve Bannon to your Donald Trump. It is. That is really true. I'm just big visions, big <laughs> statements. And then you're like the follow it up and get it got done guy. <laughs> All right, I'm down with this. I like it. So we've got uniforms. We've yep. got a place to live. Um, what are we going to do about kind of, uh, do we have any sort of, do we have to have any kind of um, systems in place to deal with like government interference or uh, the police or, or anything like that? Like, because surely we're going to come under fire. Do you need a permit? To have if a it's cult? private land, we can do whatever the fuck we want, right? Exactly. That's, I, I, and I think, well... Here's the thing, Charlie. The only reason the police get involved is when you're breaking the law. And we are yeah. going to be breaking some laws. That's the yeah. truth of it. I mean, there's no point having a cult if you're not going to have some rules that apply on your bit of land that do not apply everywhere else. But we're just going to be discreet about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what basically that? what we're going to do. We're just going to like, you know, if, when we grow in our pot, we're going to grow it underground. We're going to do it discreetly, you know? Like we're going to oh. keep it chill. How about this? Yeah. All, everything that we build on the land is built out of mirrors. So it has that effect of like, you know, the Predator's camouflage uh, technology, the way it just reflects the area around it. So I haven't been to your parents' farm, but I imagine it's just like, you know, a lot of greenery and trees and shit like that around there. So if we build everything out of mirrors, when you drive past, you might not even fucking see it. On a sunny day, direct light, maybe you'll get a glint. But generally speaking, it's just going to blend into the background. I like it, Charlie. I like it a lot. And here's the reason. It means you can right. check your hair at any time as well, which I think is a real appeal of the cult. Because this is a cult for people who, we have an actual, we have specialist hairdressers in, I'm going to get Steve. Oh, here's what I am going to do. I'm going to get Steve, my hairdresser, who I love. Yeah. Detail for men, Sydney. That, not a paid plug. I pay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but Steve, detail from men. I reckon he'd be involved in our cult. He, he might need an exception to the whole, you know, not having sex with people's wives rule, but like uh, we'll get Steve involved and he'll give all the men <laughs> the same haircut as me. Well, this is what I was just thinking is this is how people can discern the hierarchy of our cult is you have very high hair. Yeah. So you have the highest hair. Oh, love and it. then I'll, I'll come in as your second in command. Cause my hair is, I also like a, a bit of high hair, but my hair is not as high as yours. And then below me, you can have high hair, but in decreasing amounts. So if you're a newbie, I say you've got to get a crew cut. Like if you're a newbie into the cult. Love it, got Charlie. It, yeah? 
My yeah. God, it's like you've actually been thinking about this before. <laughs> but I, I, I love it. Because nothing puts people at ease more than a cult member with a shaved head. Because that always turns out really good. No, but it's about growth. It's like us stripping you back. Yeah. And then you grow into us. So, mm. and at different levels, I love it. Through the society, where you're at in the cult is reflected by the height and level of your hair. And obviously, as it goes on, our hair will get more and more ridiculous and more and more high as it goes on. That's when, you know, you know when, like when the cult's getting a bit weird. It's, that, that those, it's like Hugh Hefner at the Playboy Mansion now. It just got old and creepy really quickly. There'll be a point where yeah. just the two of us are up there with our really artificially inflated high hair. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep in charge. But I think I'm actually liking this idea of like a visual kind of coding for like if you're the big ideas man you're the kind of you know and I'm the more the practical like uh, systems and, and practices kind of guy mm. I think when you come into the cult you can choose to follow male or female you can choose to follow your line which is more kind of the esoteric you know big ideas whatever you can follow my line but you have to adopt our looks so male or female, you have to get the big hair like Will Anderson and dress all in black. And if you're following my line, then you have to get sort of more my, uh, my hairstyle, but with the facial hair. And I think that's where for the women, if they can't grow facial hair, that we provide like a, like a Merkany type beard that they can wear, like a symbolic, I follow the path of Charlie kind of thing. I really like this, Charlie, because I think I like the idea of us being a, you know, a society that isn't you know, caught up in gender and what your gender is meant to define you. I like the idea that it's a bit more like about your attitude to what role you're going to play in that society rather than it's good. I like this. This is, I mean, this is some really complex good thinking. I'm glad that we've got you on board for this because these are a lot of things <laughs> I never would have considered. I just would have started the cult. Then all these problems just would have come up. I really wouldn't have thought it through. Everyone's got different what? lengths hair. Then it's hard to bring in. People love to belong to something and they love symbols. And I think that you and I yeah. can create like a branding for our cult, which is like, look, this is a, a two-pronged cult. It sort of started on the back of Will returning to his homeland. But if you want to join us, then you can follow one of these two paths. You can be a dreamer. It can be a big thinker who can't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because you also are an old, allowed to, to sit down. <laughs> I love that. Like, because again, it's the anti-cult thing. We have no bowing. We have no kneeling. In fact, your body to be like, when you have reached the, 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 the when you have reached a, a point of enlightenment, you never will never sit again. Yeah. You're never going to get me being queen of the dragon saying bend at the knee and follow me. It's like stand up straight. In fact, never bend at the knee again. <laughs> The greatest way to I pay tribute to me is to drop something and not be able to pick it up. That's my greatest <laughs> tribute. I love it. I love it. Oh, this is great. All right. So, so what do else do we need to think about? Like, so well, do, we have we, to, do, we have, do we have to register it? Do we need to kind of... Or do we do it... Like, we think about how we built this podcast. Right. Is we started off, no publicity. We just put it out there and we tried to organically let an audience find it. Yeah. Now... Is that how we do it with the cult or do we hit the ground hard? Well, here's the thing. I guess what we've got to think about is how big do we want the cult to be, right? Because yeah. I, I feel like it's got to be, a, I feel like your problem is cult size needs to be manageable. It needs to be a community mm. of like-minded individuals. You don't want to get to the point where you kind of kind of keep an eye on everybody, that you can't kind of make sure that everybody's still on the same page. You don't want somebody getting disenfranchised by them not getting enough attention from the leaders or whatever, and then suddenly they're back right. out in the community spreading rumors about the cult. Like, we need this to be a pl I'd rather concentrate on value of, like, the amount of people who are really into the cult than, like, big numbers. So, for me... That means you've got to build it with like the most loyal followers first, right? Yeah, you're right. And I think also that exclusivity will ramp up people's enthusiasm to join. Like if we, if we took a small intake at first and right. would need to get some planning done to work out, okay, so we're going to need shelter, we're going to need water, we're going to need power, we're going to need a few of these things. Like what's the minimal amount of workers we'd need for that? So let's just say 12 people. We need 12, we need 12 people at first to kind of get this started. It's good I think enough that's for Jesus. Good, it's good enough for us. There you go. And there, I didn't even think of that. That's a good... And it's also Nick Revolt's number, so uh, that makes sense to me. Plus, if we need to play cricket against another cult, we have enough people. 
<laughs> uh, okay, so we get 12 followers to start with, and I say we see how that goes. And I let's, um, you know, we'll have uh, like a 50 50 split, six girls, six guys. Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, we're married couples, right? Or couples, they don't have to be married, but are we they don't have to be married. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Marriage is some archaic institution. Uh, I say looking at my wedding ring as I put my hand in the air. But we look, you know what? If you want to be married, that's fine. We don't, we don't mind. You bring whatever you want to the table. But we start off with 12 people. And the first thing we do is you build something where Will and I can go during the day while you guys work. <laughs> that's the first order of business. We want comfortable surrounds. Basically, we build a pod cave, which becomes our chapel in a way. Because we're going to, I imagine that every day... Uh, at the end of the day, people come into the pod cave to get their daily sermon. Right. So, I mean, much like, I mean, here's the thing. Look, I mean, a church would be a fucking great place to do a podcast. The acoustics yeah. are amazing. The environment is amazing. You know, people, you we, would have people's full attention. So we need something that is like the church of our podcast so that people can kind of gather and hear their wisdom. But I think that we need to harken back to the mythology of this podcast. And when we first started recording... Remember, we would record in the front room of my house in Randwick, yep. that really crowded room that was filled with junk, stuff that we didn't know what to do in the house. It was like an old mattress in there and just a bunch of like books and all that kind of stuff. I think we should recreate that room, but in a kind of like symbolically like recreate that room. So it's, uh, it could almost be carved out of like granite or marble or maybe sort of shaped out of wood or something just to resemble that room. How about if, because here's the thing, that room was pretty shitty, man. And if we're going to have a... about that, Will. No, but no, but here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to take your idea and I'm just going to spin it a little bit. That's all I'm saying right. is... So yeah. I think we want somewhere better than we've ever recorded the podcast. We, if we're going to get people oh, to build right. something for us, we want it to be a place that we're very you know, excited and happy to go every day. But I think to get there... Like much like one of those exhibitions through history or whatever, or when you walk through something and it gives you different eras of time, you have to walk through a recreation of all the various places uh, that we've done the yeah. podcast. So you walk through yes. one dedicated to your old room, like the pod cave, you've got my LA yeah. place, like that you can recreate yeah. and sort of see the history, the kind of mythology of yeah. what's happened beforehand. Yeah, right. So it's kind of like when you go into a Catholic church, you've got the Stations of the Cross, which is all the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. So that's what the stained glass windows are. It's like, okay, this is the stages that led to the birth of this religion. So I think that's perfect. You could have like Junior, Ramona, Winona, like all these kind of uh, religious relics recreated. You're right. But the space itself, they could all be just like artifacts within the, 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 uh, within the, uh, the, the, whatever it is, what would it be like a, well, here's the thing I was going to say is it, it's, it's a little bit like the, the old Testament, everything that came before now is old Testament. So it's not Canon yep. for the religion and the cult, but it's things that people yep. look for meaning in. So that like people yep. go back over old, you know, they go, well, they recorded it here. And you talked about Kathy Bates traveling through time on a lazy Susan. And what interpretation yes. does that have for the way that we, but it's not, you know, like much like the Old Testament and the New Testament, basically, basically once Jesus got to earth, went, well, all that old stuff, it's kind of like, you know, we're starting fresh from now. You can kind of read Yeah, and I believe, I believe that's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus came down and said, hey, dudes, all that old stuff, like, forget it. We're just, this, we're starting from now. <laughs> but that's kind of what it is, right? Yeah, 100%. Like, it's the second, it's the, it's the, it's the New Testament of Tophol. Well, as much as I'm loving uh, this talk of religion, uh, it's, uh, we should uh, reference our, our brand new sponsor, Movement Watchers. Um, if anyone listens to podcasts, they're probably quite familiar uh, with the Movement Watchers story. Um, it's a company that was started by uh, two guys who wanted stylish, uh, high fashion looking watches, but for a fraction of the price. Um, it's pronounced, move, sorry, it's spelled MVMT, but pronounced movement. And uh, they actually sent me uh, one of their watches. I'm not a watch person. Will, I never really understood the need for a watch when you've got a mobile phone. But um, they sent me one and I've got to admit that uh, I kind of like it. I kind of like having that watch in my hand. It sort of makes me feel like a grown-up. Well, here's the thing, Charlie. I like this company because, you know, these two guys, they looked at like the market. They saw a problem in the market. They identified it and they went about creating something themselves, right? That's like yeah. us and our cult. 
This is literally the same sort of thing that we had. We've seen a hole in the cult market and then two guys have got together with a dream and they've tried to create something. We're trying to create a movement. Like a yeah. cult, but a movement, That's and they're creating a movement. So, I mean, like, it could not be could more we, on brand. I mean, have in the history of cults, has any cult had a major brand partner? Well, that's what you need. Because, like, the Heaven's Gate cult, like, I think they gave everybody Nikes, but I don't think they had a deal with Nike. I don't think they'd reached out to Phil Knight or Michael Jordan or somebody <laughs> and said, hey, can you send us, like, 90 free Nikes? We're about to lop our balls off to go to another planet, you know? Do you think that was a missed opportunity? There's some guy in the marketing department in Nike. He's like, oh, God damn it. This has got, like, national press coverage. We really missed the boat. What? We really missed the comment on this one. Here's what I would say about, you know, uh, Movement Watches is, like, clearly... It's going to make a lot of news if some shit goes down at the cult, whatever the shit is go down. And if everybody involved in the cult knows exactly what time the plan is happening because they're all wearing stylish and affordable watches, then that's got to be good product placement, surely. Yeah, 100%. And the best thing, Will, is that these movement watches, they start at just $95. Now, it says here that at a department store for the same kind of watch, you're looking to spend between $400 and $500. Have you ever spent that much on a watch? Mate, I would give somebody $300 to tell me what the time is before I spent $500 on a watch. <laughs> it's kind of like that sunglasses philosophy for me. It's like, you know, these are sort of small items that you are likely to leave behind or lose or whatever. Um, you still want the thing to look good, but to be spending four or $500 on something that you're going to leave on a friend's, you know, in a friend's couch or something like that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, these guys, I know this is not in the ad that we're doing for them today, but you know, it's their first time on board. And I just know this from listening to other podcasts. They do awesome sunglasses because movement do, do sunglasses really? as well. And apparently they they look really cool and they're really affordable. Movement sunglasses, it doesn't really, it, 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 I mean, movement watches make sense, but movement sunglasses, they shouldn't have just, should have changed the kind of, like, maybe it should have been like a, like a sub company, like, I don't know, Lenzi sunglasses. Charlie, do you really think you should be giving company. this feedback to our sponsor on the first time they've <laughs> supported us on the podcast? <laughs> Well, they're doing something right because they have sold over a million watches in over 160 countries. And the best thing, Will, is if you're listening to this show, you like our show and you think you maybe want a movement watch, you can get 15% off with free shipping and free returns by going to movement.com forward slash TOFOP, T-O-F-O-P. I've got to be honest with you. I've listened to a lot of podcasts over the years and you're obviously for different you know, offers and codes and stuff. They go, so if you buy one, make sure you put in our code. And it's one of those things where you're just like, oh, wow. That's actually happening on our podcast now. We have a code. <laughs> it's quite exciting. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We've complained a lot about naming our show TOFOP and having to explain what it means. But when it comes to offer codes, it's actually really good. Like, thank God we didn't call it 30-odd foot of pod because that would have been much harder to say forward slash 30-odd foot of pod. TOFOP is easy to remember. It's easy to put in. It almost goes naturally after slash. And nobody else has taken it. <laughs> There's not one issue where you say, we're going to put TOEFOP, and they're like, that's already taken. <laughs> uh, go to movement.com forward slash TOEFOP and join the movement today. There you go. All right, we're back to the normal programming. Um, so, this is great. Uh, do you want to talk about the cult some more or do you want to move on? Because we got some letters during the week as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, are you talking about the follow-up to, uh, to our previous episode? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, all right. Well, have you got it there? Let's, let's get to it. I do indeed. Uh, I, I, well, I, should I use this listener's name? Maybe I shouldn't because of the nature no. of the, uh, yeah. the, com the conversation that's been had. But uh, so um, one of our listeners has written to us after the last episode we did that was all around a particular night of adult entertainment called the Saints and Saints Sinners Ball. Saints and Sinners Ball, yeah. So uh, we went through the frequently asked questions on the website. We asked a lot of questions of our own. Uh, whether they were frequently asked or not. Uh, we explored a lot of issues. You can go back, you can revisit that podcast. But one of our listeners had some extra information that he could share with us, Charlie. Yep. Hey, guys, I just got on the show. Bloody love it already. Well, you didn't get on the show. Well, actually, you just did. You just got on the show. Oh, my God. He's a time oh traveler. God. How did you know? <laughs> He's using right, his mate. movement watch. <laughs> you did just get on the show. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, uh, listen to your episode on Saints and Sinners. I have to say I went to one a couple of years back. My mate was dating a girl from Sexyland. Now, oh. 
I should firstly point out to our international listeners, and maybe even just our interstate listeners, that Sexyland is a brand, like a, a franchise of adult stores, like a Club X or that sort of thing, where you can go and buy yeah. like sort of, you know, any sort of adult entertainment items and, you know, sex toys and stuff like that, right? I mean, it's funny. I'm, we're, I'm in Adelaide at the moment and there is a, a quite a large Sexyland on the way up to the studios where we're filming. It's huge. Like, it's the size of a small kind of shopping mall. And I would have thought in this era of, like, Amazon and free delivery, like, if you're wanting to buy sex stuff, like, wouldn't you want to sort of do it in the privacy of your own home, have it delivered to your front door? Or is there something about, like, going to a retail store? You know when people talk about, like, oh, I like shopping for clothes in actual stores because I get to try them on and all that kind of stuff. Is it the same kind of thing with, like, sex toys and costumes and all that kind of stuff? Well... I, I don't know how many of them they let you try on. I mean, I imagine you can't, like, try out a butt plug just to see if it fits or whatever. But, but well, Will, I imagine with butt plugs it's one size fits all. Good point, Charlie. I hadn't thought that through. <laughs> but my point being that it might be like that where sometimes you go and you check it out at Sexy Land because you might not know what things are available to you. So you go to the retail mm. environment, maybe then you go home and you order it online. But... I guess at Sexy Land, you can sort of just like, you can make some impulse sexy purchases as well. If you go out to Sexy Land, you're like, we're going to a bachelorette party. I don't know exactly what we want. Do we want like, do we want penis like straws or do we want like, you know, dicks that we can put on our heads? What sort of dick related things do we want yeah, for a exactly. bachelorette party? We just want penises we can either drink things through or wear on our clothes. You know how Disneyland is called the happiest place on earth? Do you think when Sexyland came yeah. out with their slogan, they went with uh, the horniest place on earth? Because that would be a good advertising slogan. <laughs> well, the sexiest place on earth yeah. seems to be more logical, right? Sure, maybe. I mean, they've got a character, Dickie Mouse. It's a, it's a whole thing. But so Sexyland... <laughs> hey, did you say Dickie Mouse or Dick in Mouth? Because I think oh, well. either of those work well. <laughs> It's a mouse, but his name is Dickie, Dick and Mouth. <laughs> get it, guys? We He's wearing no it. pants. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, his girlfriend worked at Sexy Land. She wasn't from yep. Sexy Land. She worked at Sexy Land. Um, my mate was, oh, well, his mate was dating a girl from Sexy Land and she got his tickets. That's how you get in as a single bloke. So if you're a, that, we, that oh, was one right. of the rules we discovered. You can't get is that in a as hack? a single bloke. But there's a That's hack. That's a Saints and Sinners hack. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. You can get in the back door to see people then get in the back door. So, <laughs> nice. uh, it's true that you go in street clothes, confirmed, because that's what we discovered. Right. You go in your street clothes, you get changed into your costume once you get there, and then get changed inside. We all dressed as Zorro. So, three of us had Zorro masks, no shirt, jocks, Fake pencil mustache drawn on and a black cape. Nope. So okay, jocks, sure. So Zorro and his jocks, basically. I can't remember. Can you? Uh, when we did the uh, original uh, story, was was there? Were they themed knights, or was it just come in any fancy dress? Any it was fancy anything, dress, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you had to come in fancy dress though, but any sort of fancy dress. So the three of them have gone as Zorro, three Zorros. Okay. Haven't put a lot of thought yeah. into it. This is why they don't Not invite really. single blokes to these fucking things, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the night, I was shitting myself a couple of times. First was after getting changed. You receive a garbage bag to put your street clothes in and you line up to put them in a locker. At this time, I had a woman behind me who thought it would be a great idea for her to stick her finger up my ass. <laughs> Wow. So that's what happens, right? Like once you're through the doors, it's like fucking game on. Like anything goes. Well, I assume that wasn't security. I assume it was just like, okay, now we're in our costumes. <laughs> or maybe she's a nurse. Like maybe it was just like a routine prostate exam. I mean, maybe that's a really good campaign that the prostate people have done. They're like, you know what? People have a hard time getting their prostate checked, but there's one night where no one really minds. So if you could just go down to the Saints and Sinners, do like 80, yeah. like this woman's <laughs> the mother to raise her of prostate checks. She can't wait yeah. for Saints and Sinners. Well, it's like, oh, mate, where have you been? Oh, I just got my uh, prostate checked by that sexy nurse. It's like, that's no sexy nurse, dude. That's an actual nurse. 
Um, I had a young ma- married couple come up to my brother and I who said her fantasy was to have brothers uh, do the job while her husband watched. Uh, what job's that? Build a shelf? Yeah. Do it, like, do put it together an Ikea shelf. And she wanted to shame him because he cannot do that. And that was her fantasy. So, so her fantasy isn't just to... Uh, like her husband's fantasy is not just to see his wife make love to two other men. It had to be brothers. brothers. That's the specific quirk. Yeah. Wow. He got his first erection watching the Will Ferrell movie Step Brothers. And <laughs> since then. Uh, all right. So uh, they did not go with that. Um, he, do, he does add after that though. Mind you, my brother and I are sickened by each other if we even have to shake hands. I mean, <laughs> I love it. Sickened. <laughs> then the final... Sickened, but not, not too sickened by each other to be in a bloody uh, orgy, fancy dress orgy. Oh, mate, but let's not shake hands. We went dressed as the exact same character to an orgy as single guys in our jocks, but if we shake Don't hands, shake I'm hands. sickened, mate. That's weird. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the final straw for me was standing at the bar. While waiting for a drink, I had a man in it, a man dressed as Barney Rubble next to me. Then I see that man start grinding his teeth together and moaning. I thought, oh fuck, he's jerking off next to me. But no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. But nope. I looked down and there was Marge Simpson blowing. Barney. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. you think you would have seen Marge's hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't think you'd have to, ne- like, look down to see that. Ah, oh, that would be... I mean, first of all, like, they're two different properties. It would never be in the same universe, so that would be confusing. But second of all, yeah, that's strange. Well, he does actually add, it's not always great to see connecting universes with your favourite cartoon characters. <laughs> <laughs> there was another uh, a listener who got in contact with us again we will we'll protect, well, we won't mention his name to protect his anonymity he said uh, guys i can answer a couple of questions for the shoot your shooting chat you had i wasn't there but i have a bit of insider knowledge uh the man in question was dressed as the jared Le- leto 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 jared leto joker and the joker was servicing harley which is nice it's good oh. to see I'm, I'm glad i'm glad that was the situation I mean, but even better for the real of reveal of want to know how I got these scars. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. that would be just perfect if the police come in and the Joker's going down on Harley Quinn and then he just turns around like with, you know, just on th- that look on his face of like, want to know how I got these scars? Great moment. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, he finishes his email by saying, I can't reveal my sources, but let's keep it in the theme and say, I work, I would work alongside Jim Gordon. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. So that kind of terrifies me a bit because that suggests that maybe someone from law enforcement <laughs> listens to this podcast. I mean, again, the, the, well, c- could you please not rat on us for our cult, mate? <laughs> oh, oh, and by the way, we're not growing weed. We're not growing weed. It's just a lot of mirrors in a field, mate. It's just mirrors in a field. <laughs> the, um, they actually published some photos when they did this. Uh, oh, because there, there was actually a follow-up story regarding um, this guy. Saying, Just give me one second to find it. There was a follow-up story. Uh, about the Saints and Sinners Ball, Will. Um, This is from the ABC News website by Sarah Farnsworth, dated the 10th of August. Headline, Inflation Nightclub, colon. Leaked vision shows police dancing with swingers before shooting. Oh, no. Hang on, no. Now, maybe our mate uh, who worked with Commissioner Gordon uh, has got some inside info on this. I'll I'll read it, and if uh, if someone wants to... Was it the real police, or was it just people who may have been dressed as police characters at the ball police danced and mingled with swingers at a melbourne nightclub in the hours before officers shot two people at the venue leaked security footage shows dale ewings 35 and zeta sukis 37 are suing the state of victoria after being shot at the swingers costume party at the king street club on july 8th 
They were shot at about 3 a.m. in an upstairs section of the club after police received reports a man was armed with a gun at the Inflation Nightclub during what was described as an erotic fancy ball. Oh, <laughs> that's adorable. That's adorable. That's adorable. Imagine yeah, if, erotic fancy ball. Yeah. Imagine if that's what happened with Cinderella. She yeah. went to the ball <laughs> with her stepsisters. And just, <laughs> Wasn't a pumpkin she was riding in. Yeah, it's just like, you know what, Cinderella, if you could just put all those fancy clothes in this garbage bag and get into your <laughs> costume. <laughs> the prince the goes around trying the... to find the butt plug that fits the girl of his dreams. <laughs> <laughs> the glass butt plug. <laughs> The vision from the night shows two male poli uh, police officers. Hang on. I thought no single dudes were allowed into this fucking thing. Did these guys go to sexy land as well? The vision from the night shows two male police officers in the downstairs area mingling with scantily clad partygoers who hug and press up against them. The two officers do not appear to attempt to separate themselves from the women. <laughs> oh, well, I mean... Sometimes in that environment, it's hard. It's you just don't want to make a fuss. It's probably just easier. Okay, hang on. They've got they've got a link to the footage. I'm watching it now. Okay. So it basically, it's quite a busy night. A lot of people in fancy dress. There seems to be a girl, topless girl, two topless girls in lingerie, dancing. Police officer. He seems to just be looking around. He's got his hands on his belt, not really doing anything. He's got his back to the girls. She comes up now. She's wiggling her bum at him. He doesn't seem to be paying much attention. Oh, no, this girl's like she's actually face to face talking very closely with the police officer as a girl stands behind him and wiggles her bum at him. This is like porn for the blind. Oh, she had, <laughs> and she's putting her arms around him. Now, the police officer, it's later in the footage. They're standing at this railing looking over the dance floor. And he's just, it just looks like he's talking to one of the girls. I don't think there's flirting. She touches his chest in a flirtatious manner. What's he meant to he do, though? He's not again. meant to bash it away, though, right? You just let it go, right? No. Well, I, I mean, they say that they're, they're seen dancing. I can't really see dancing. Another girl has sidled up to them now, and the two girls are kind of having a bit of a cuddle. The cop has taken a step away from them. Look, this looks like they're behaving quite professionally to me. Oh, now the girl's put her arm around the cop, and she's yeah. dancing. Yeah. And he's walking away. Look, it doesn't look. From my take on this... Oh, no, hang on. Now she's sticking her ass into his crotch <laughs> and wiggling it about. Uh... All right, look, my take on it is the uh, the cops seem to... They, you're right, well, what else is he meant to do? Like, the girls are obviously coming up to sort of flirt and, you know, chat with them and stuff. It wasn't like he suddenly just, like, threw his gun belt to the ground and started fucking dancing. Uh, he just seems to be like... he's. You know what he's doing? He's reading the room. Right, in the spirit of the occasion. I imagine if you're, like, someone who's trying to control a crowd, like, say you're at the footy or those sort of things, you see cops kind of have a joke with someone at the footy or kind of like, yeah. you know, it's you're kind of trying to control the environment. And police, in general, I mean, I'm sure there are many people who have been in situations where they would not have this experience. But, like, a lot of police in general are just trying to, like, do their job and make sure everyone has a good time in a kind of safe way. So, that, you know, they're not like you don't need to be slapping people's hands away or being too, you know, vicious in that situation. But again, here's what I would have preferred, Charlie. I just feel yeah. like they should have had to put their police uniforms in garbage bags and get changed into <laughs> something else. That's what I think. The two officers do not appear to attempt to separate themselves from the women. Yeah. But they don't appear to be doing anything either. One officer is seen in close proximity to a woman in fancy just in 90 seconds before she lets go of him. And another woman wraps her arms around him. According to the camera timestamp, police officers were at the venue for 90 minutes before the shooting. They were surrounded by half-naked patrons who paid them little attention. It is unclear whether the police were still at the venue at the time of the shooting. A source has told the ABC police... Has told the ABC, police often did walkthroughs at the nightclub, but they were usually a couple of minutes and then the officers left. <laughs> yeah, okay. That, all right, that, that's a bit more suspect. Like, why did they feel the need to stay there for like, you know, an hour? On this night, the source said the police were there for a notably longer time. <laughs> of course they were. They weren't patrolling. They stood there enjoying themselves, the source said. Speculation. The defense rests, Your Honor. <laughs> The source said the vision showed there was no drama, everyone was relaxed, uh, and the man with the toy gun had been at the club since 11.50pm that night. So at least three hours before the shooting, that guy had been walking around with his toy gun. 
The day after the police shooting, Superintendent Lisa Hardman said the v- venue security. I mean, was seriously, early. just just for the record, when you're the spokesperson who's doing, you know, the speaking out on an issue of people having sex at a Saints and Sinners ball, do you think there was any speculation of going? Maybe we shouldn't get Lisa Hardman. <laughs> to be our spokesperson on this. Is there anyone who has a less sexual sounding name who can be the spokesperson for this? Yeah, Clark Erection, can you uh, come <laughs> take over here, please? <laughs> Superintendent Lisa Hardman said venue security uh, was told earlier in the night that the gun was fake, but the firearm was leveled at police, prompting their response. In oh, court okay. documents, Mr. Ewans and, Mr. S- and Mrs. Sukis alleged they were surrounded by 10 members of the critical incident response team before Ms. Sukis was shot by one or more of the officers. It is alleged that Mr. Ewans was also tasered, punched in the face, forced to the ground, and handcuffed. Now, but that was Will, a, that was a, that was earlier in the night. It had nothing to do with the police incident. <laughs> or is it possible that those guys thought he actually was Jared Leto and were like, mate, suicide was terrible. We're gonna punch you in the face and tase you. This is for sending people condoms of your own semen. They're your work colleagues. It's inappropriate behavior. <laughs> Nightclub owner uh, Martha Samus had previously said that the police overreacted to the situation and the man only had a toy gun, which nightclub security had informed police about. She also contradicted the police account that the man aimed the gun at officers and said he was in a compromising position with a female partner. And, like, if that is true, I sort of take the side of, of, of Mr. Ewing's. Like, it's pretty hard to be doing that and also pointing a gun at police, right? I mean... It's hard for us to speculate on this, but yes, like, I mean, just logistically, if what you're saying is correct, if indeed he was mid, like, you know, fellatio, right? <laughs> Your Honour. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I like it. Could they call it an erotic fancy dress ball? So I think fellatio is a, is a perfectly appropriate term. Yes. Right. Uh, Continue. He was, yeah. He was upper, Your Honour. So... <laughs> I believe he was growling her out, Your Honor. <laughs> Your Honor, if I could take the court. If it uh, pleases the court, if it pleases the court, <laughs> Mr. Ewing was, I believe, growling her out. He was chewing on the carpet. He was chomping down on some box. <laughs> no objections, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Sustained. In a, in a statement, Victoria Police said all police movements on the night of the shooting would be investigated by its professional standards command. Police members are expected to attend licensed venues and are regularly approached by patriots to engage them in conversation, a spokeswoman said. Police are expected at all times to conduct themselves professionally. As the investigation is ongoing, it would be inappropriate to comment further. Do you remember in the late 90s or the mid 90s, there was a big story in Victoria about um, a bunch of police officers or a couple of police officers went to a, do a walkthrough of a nightclub and one of the officers was videoed or, or, or they had at least photos taken of him like dancing on a bar top, like, like actually like in a hands above the head, like really just like letting loose. And it was this huge kind of controversy. It's like, that's not appropriate behavior. Now I get that, but from what I've seen, these guys just seem to be like, as you say, reading the room. Right. I mean, in a general sense, I have no problem with it. I mean, it, there's a bit of a thing at the moment where cops are going viral. Have you noticed that? It seems to be no. that somebody's gone around the police forces and gone, hey, guys, uh, we don't have the best reputation with the public at the moment. Um, is there any chance uh, you could dance to Beyonce at halftime of a women's basketball game? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I've seen Or whatever. Movies. You know, there's, there seems yeah. to be these, like, police flash mobs and, like, kind of cool police viral videos and stuff that are happening at the moment. So I think you need that in your police force. You need your sort of characters. Well, when I was growing up, like whenever there was like a, like a school fair or, you know, some kind of community event or whatever, there would always be a police rock band would right. turn up and they always had a name like, you know, you know, uh, like check one, two, uh, red light, blue light or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, code blue or whatever, right? Code blue, yeah, something like that. And where, I mean, do they still exist? Like, that, maybe that's what we need. Like, on the next kind of X Factor or whatever, let's get the police band out, man. 
Yeah, I mean, that'd be great, actually. It'd be good if they... Oh, why don't they do one of those, like, how Survivor does, like, you know, heroes versus villains, or they do, like, blue collar versus white collar. You could get all the different... Because they all have their own different... The armed forces and, you know, the ambulance, the all those sort of places. You could compete them against each other. Or what about, like, we update it? Like, instead of, like, a police band, like, think about kind of gangster rap and hip-hop. Traditionally, has a very anti-police vibe to it. Right. But if you've got a bunch of police, instead of fuck the police, it's hug the police. Hug, hug, hug the police, you know? Like, it's kind of like, it's, it's just rapping all about, like, law, being a law-abiding person. Oh, yeah. We're uh, PWA. <laughs> and we'd like to tell you to hug the police. That would be great. That would be great if the police had a hip hop act called PWA. PWA. It's and they got they're police without attitudes. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's always like hug the police. Hug, 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 hug the police. Hug the police. Yeah. <laughs> Straight out of Pentridge. You're gonna be on parole. Oh, I can't do it. Hey, um, Let's wrap this up. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell people about our fucking massive live shows happening at the Opera House? Yeah, we're doing two shows at the Sydney Opera House. It's September the 15th and 16th, so it's less than a month away now. So we should you mm. know, have a think about it and book some guests and stuff like that. But <laughs> um, it's it's pretty huge. I mean, obviously doing shows at the Sydney Opera House, our tiny little podcast. We've got a sponsor now. We've, we're doing shows at the Opera House. I mean, we're still talking about the same old crap. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's a bit... <laughs> It's a brave new world and there are some tickets available. I think there's like a couple to one of the shows. One show is pretty much sold out, but I think there's a couple of random tickets if you want to go by yourself or whatever. And uh, the second show, there is not actually, it's selling pretty quick. So if people want to come to those shows, please get in as quick as you possibly can and uh, we'll find some awesome guests and they will be really fun and brilliant shows. I mean, it'll be amazing to do this podcast at the Sydney Opera House and I think uh, you'll enjoy being part of it. <laughs> I mean, that I gotta say, Will, like, I mean, I think you'll enjoy being part of it isn't really the greatest sales pitch. No, that was to you, Charlie. I was saying, I oh, thought right. you'll be, oh, yeah. I think you'll enjoy being part of it. Yeah, I don't know yeah, what the I audience think will think, but I think you'll enjoy doing a show at the Opera House. <laughs> We've also got a website, tofop.com, uh, which has this and many other fine podcasts. We do an AFL podcast if you're into the Aussie rules. Will does a, a couple of podcasts on his own. He does a highbrow one called Willosophy. Yeah, I've done a couple of new episodes recently. Tim Ferguson, that's a great episode up there. And uh, Bridget Fettersy, who might be a name that not everybody knows, but it's a, it's a really fantastic uh, podcast. She came in with an 11-point philosophy all of her own, and we went through it point by point. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun. It's really brilliant. So if you don't know her, check that out. And Fofop, which is kind of the spinoff of this podcast, uh, we've been having a little run because I've been in America and, I've, you know, there's other comedians mm. around. So there's a bunch of really cool episodes up. There'll be one that goes up around the same time as people hear this with uh, Bert Kreischer. Might, people might know him from his podcast, uh, The Bert Cast, and he was brilliant to sit down with. Um, there's a, a Joel McHale one. Uh, there is uh, Gareth from The Dollop, who people will know, Gareth Reynolds. I, I um, heard, the, I listened to your Joel McHale one. Can I ask, is he very handsome in real life? Well, okay, so... Uh, I'll answer some questions that both you've had okay. and then some that listeners have had, and I'm happy to answer them both, which is yeah, firstly, go. yes, he's very handsome. And yes, he's, he is handsome. He's real life handsome, as in like, you, sometimes when you see people on the screen, they look handsome on the screen or whatever, they don't actually look handsome in real life. He's real life mm. handsome. And he's, you know how I knew, you know how I know he's handsome is that when Foz did, because you know, when Will does an episode of Faux Fop, uh, James Fosdyke will do a little like uh, illustration, a caricature of Will and who his guest is. And it's the most handsome caricature you've ever seen. Like generally caricatures like make fun of someone's features, but I'm like, wow, even his caricature is handsome. Yeah, I reckon Foz would have got it and just gone, this is actually a hard one to draw because there's nothing yeah. about his face that is imperfect that I can sort of <laughs> <laughs> mock. Right. So um, <laughs> some people have asked me, they said that, that he, they thought he was a bit hard work. Look, I, when we were doing it, th there was certainly some times when like he didn't necessarily run with the ball and stuff, but I actually found him a very generous and kind of pleasant guy and like he was a like you know, I mean, we we had a really nice relaxed fun chat for two guys who had literally never met until 2 minutes before we started recording the podcast. So, um I I really but enjoyed it. That's also it, but... his, that's also his shtick. Like I heard it and I just thought he sounded like Joel McHale. Right. Like Joel McHale is that sardonic kind of guy like you know it, that's his that's his whole sh if you 
if you didn't know who he was and listened to it, you maybe would have thought it was hard work. But I didn't. Th- I just heard the Joel McHale that I know from the Soup and Community and all those shows. Well, that was my vibe as well. So that's what I wanted to say because yeah. a few people have gone, "Oh, he was a bit hard work," and I was like, "Well, normally I know the person, so we have a bit of a you know kind of more, more relaxed vibe." But to me, as a person in real life, he was a gen- generous and fun and lovely person. So. Uh, so check that one out. And um, there's one with the guys from uh, The Weekly Planet, which uh, is, of course, you know, Planet Broadcasting. And uh, um, that's a really fun podcast as well. If you listen to The Weekly Planet and you want to know a bit about what those guys, you know, where they came from and what they were doing before The Weekly Planet and stuff like that, um, it's it's up there as well. And you, if you like the episode of Faux Fop of The Weekly Planet and you want to get a bit of Tofop flavor in your Weekly Planet, two episodes ago I was a guest on the weekly planet and then the week before that will was a guest so if you like those guys and they are brilliant like their show is so funny and they're so awesome and much more knowledgeable and much better at this than you and i are um you can they hear- really are though I it's know. kind of the more i've listened to their show because now i'm kind of deep, diving deep on it and i'm listening to heaps of back catalogs and stuff and i'm like <sighs> No wonder these guys are so successful. They're really good. (laughs) I know. It's fucking annoying, right? Like even when I went round to uh, their place to record and the setup they have, it's like, oh, this actually looks like a proper setup. (laughs) Like this isn't like anything that we've done in fucking eight years. I mean, essentially that's why we've clung on to them desperately though in the hope that some of that might rub on up off on us. So (laughs) let's hope so. Uh, and that's about it also if you want to support the show in other ways yes we have sponsors now but um, you know we still uh, rely on uh, on your generosity to to hire people like Mike Hal who produces the show and James Fosdyke who does the artwork so if you'd like to support the show you can go to patreon.com um, and, and just donate any amount that you want um, within Patreon there's some bonus content including James Fosdyke's amazing comic strip Everyone Relax which is art inspired by the show um, and also there's different uh, subscription levels for, for things like live shows and if you want to go at the highest tier you can get an exclusive copy of the TOEFOP 100 book um, so don't think that just because we've got a sponsor now that we're suddenly rolling the money we still do rely on uh, on the community for support um, hopefully it's, yeah it's look up it's worth it pointing it out that the reason that we've decided to take on sponsors of the podcast because we've talked to you guys about this for years and we've been doing this show for nearly eight years now and yeah we've never had sponsors or anything on but what's basically happened is that like the patreon was great because it's given us enough money to hire michael and to kind of just like for the podcast to not really cost us money anymore because it used to cost us money to do the show Mm. and the patreon's got to that point where you know the show doesn't really cost us money to do anymore but neither of us have ever taken money out of the podcast we've never actually taken a dollar out of it individually as like a wage or anything and we still won't be in a position to do that uh with a couple of sponsorships (laughs) going on board um this is literally to just try to hopefully keep us it's a brand new world now. When we started out, it was, you know, as you guys know, it was enough to just have a podcast. Um, our podcast isn't about anything because we didn't know it needed to be about something. Mm. That's only a recent thing that your yeah. podcast had to be about something. And now all these big networks are coming in and they're spending a lot of money and there's a lot of new shows. And if we just want to keep being able to do our thing, we need to be able to at least have some funds to be able to grow our podcast and keep doing stuff. So at the moment, um, your support is as valuable to us as if it ever was so if you enjoy the podcast even if you just want to like i i would highly recommend if you've got a dollar a month if you just want to sign up to the dollar a month just so you can get james fosdyke's art Mm. it is worth it alone for that it's a good way to support the podcast yeah could have said it better myself and uh i'm charlie clausen i'm will anderson